Okay, so we can resume. And uh, thank you for all of you that uh, you know had questions in the break. So this helps me a lot to understand what what's, what's clear, what is not, and what what could be explained better as well. Okay, so we were talking about this example, right? So during the break, I uploaded the files. So basically this file and the database and everything on the GitHub. So you have it for, for experimenting it uh, as well. You should have it, yes, okay. So I just uh, put the example before the, the read line in a folder, okay. And there's an SQLite tray folder where we have a number of examples that we will see uh, uh, later today. I mean, maybe not all of them, but we have this queries JS, okay? So we can try this behavior. You see these numbers on the right. We would like to execute this code with this uh, for loop, uh, you know, executing first uh, uh, the query with the insert and then the select and so on. So this is just a, a way of testing the database. We don't really need to write this kind of code off, uh, I mean, in a in a web application, but we would like to insert a new value and then ask uh, how many values are in the database, a new value and so on, just to see that the value increments. And if it doesn't increment, it means that the previous query, the insert has not been executed yet, okay? So uh, uh, we, we try to solve this problem, okay? But before trying, let's have a look if, if this actually happens and luckily, well, in a certain sense, luckily it happens. So remember that the uh, first thing you need to do when you try this example is to run npm install, okay? I already did it uh, during the break because this creates the nodes modules folder that is where the actual uh, code of the libraries uh, of the package the SQL3 is contained, okay? And then uh, you can take one of these examples and run it, okay? Of course, you need to have the database as well. And we have these files. Uh, I already put three files here, okay? So, well, that was the exams uh, file just to test the other example, but I mean, we don't really need to test it now. Um, Queries.js uh, is uh, what we have on the slide. So the for loop, uh, W uh, 0 to 100 with the insert and the select count, okay? And uh, um, let's run it. So we have uh, node queries.js, just run. And you see the numbers, well, we are lucky here, but uh, sometimes we are not lucky, you see? There are three times uh, 1,088, uh, uh, okay? That means that the select count is run three times and, and uh, uh, in the meanwhile, no insert was run, right? And then uh, we have a jump, you see, 89, 92, and so on. Of course, I already had uh, some numbers in the database, so there were already some rows, okay? I didn't start from scratch. If you want to start from scratch, you can take the data empty and copy it on the data SQL. Um, paste, actually, don't really, well, I think we can just delete the data SQL and, and copy the data empty. So I show you also, uh, yes, copy and paste. Okay, maybe you need to, okay, stay on the directory, paste. Okay, this data empty copy, we rename it to, to data, okay. Uh, by the way, you can also open these files. Uh, of course, you can uh, use uh, a program specifically designed by, for SQL Lite 3. Uh, I think uh, there's something on the slides. And anyway, there's this, oh, I forgot to install it here. Oh, well, anyway, there's uh, this program, SQL uh, DB browser for SQL Lite. Okay. This is very useful, okay? But this is a standalone program, okay? Uh, you can 
have it uh, for any system, so that's for Windows, uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, and so on. Okay. Uh, I think I forgot to install it. DB browse. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, for next time I, I will have it. Uh, but uh, I mean, just to for reading the content. Probably an extension of Visual Studio Code is more useful. So uh, I invite you to have a look at the extension. That's this button here on the left. Okay. You write SQLite. Okay. SQLite. Okay. Uh, take something that is, uh, you know, reasonably. Uh, used uh, and widespread in the community. You see the number of downloads. Uh, the first one has two million downloads and the second one, well, uh, almost a million and, and you see the difference. Anyway, I recommend you the first one, this Alex CVZZ, and just install it, okay? It's just a click, okay? And then you can forget about the, the plugin, uh, oops, the, the plugin, um, tab and just go back to the files open uh, let's try to configure you know uh, an editor for this SQLite 3 there should be this uh, 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 what's the name no I wanted to I didn't want to try it before because I wanted to show it to you I think maybe we should um, no, open. We, I, we should get something for. Well, actually, the best thing is to read the instruction first. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, because uh, this recognizes the DB extension, not the SQLite extension, but you, you should uh, be able to to use it. Uh, let's close it uh, just one minute. Okay. It's called. Okay. Let's see if we can. Um, uh, no. I mean, we should be able to open it. Uh, I did it. Open with. Uh, Just let me try just this thing, DP. Okay. No. Okay. Now it gives a. Uh, uh, should. Oh. <sighs> if anybody has any idea, is very welcome. Um, yeah, it should the station in D. Let's try to disable and enable it. Okay, should work uh, to show us something. Hmm? Yeah, it works, but not on this uh, vision. Ah, you mean the, the second one? Yeah, viewer. Okay, Let, let's try this one as your colleague suggested. Okay. Uh, I guess maybe I forgot to install. Well, these are the kind of things that we can, uh, you know, solve uh, in the lab. I don't want to spend too much time here. Ju uh, just me. Let me. Uh, uh, let me apt cache search. Probably it was not, you know, the um, school I try was not installed. The lab. So it was. Light 3, yeah, command line interface. Probably it uh, uses the command line interface when it. Uh, 
Yeah, I just uh, changed the, the PC because it works better. You know, I, I tried it again because it's better for recording and so on, but you know, probably not everything was ready for, for uh, as in the last one, so. Uh, okay, now it's working. Yeah, uh, it should be, yeah. Okay, okay, so let me rename it. We, we need the other extension. Uh, just because we, we coded it into the, into the JavaScript, right? So we called it data SQLite, but you can, you can um, use whatever extension you like. I mean, try not to use JS, of course, it's not a JS file, we just have a confusion, but any extension you like, it's just a binary file, okay? And we just discovered you need to have the package installed if you're working in Linux, okay? The, the SQLite 3 package, because it basically relies on some um, uh, commands uh, uh, available in the Linux system, okay? Anyway, uh, let's uh, have a look at the database. So uh, that's empty, right? Because they copied the empty file. So there's just uh, one table that is called number, which one column, which is called number, okay? And so let's run it again. We start from one, right? Uh, and we go up to 100, but you see what happens, right? So let's try to solve this problem, okay? Uh, and the problem uh, is quite a big problem, <laughs> actually. Right? Because if, if you have just a couple of things, you nest the second, the second thing you would like to do in the first one. So basically, you write the code of the second thing in the callback of the first, and that's fine, right? But if you start to have many things to write, like uh, when app, uh, like it happened when when we tested the the, uh, the case of the input, we need to we need to write the first input to write the second one. Uh, so to, to get the second one and so on, uh, it starts to be confusing, right? Confusing is a good word. We, we, we could say it's a hell. Actually, in technical terms, they, they call it as well a callback hell. So, so uh, you know, the more you nest things, so uh, the, the more the code becomes unreadable, right? Because you need to understand that you, you are in the context of an another function in a callback and so on. And so the code you are writing is not executed now, it will be executed later and so on. So it becomes really, really messy when you are trying to understand what's happening in the code, right? Um, and so luckily in JavaScript, but actually this is a quite general concept just for JavaScript. It's uh, for all the languages that uh, are supporting and using a lot of asynchronous code. They invented this um, this uh, concept. Uh, actually, it's not just a concept; it's a, a feature, a, a language feature that is called Promise. Okay, um, it's a way of simplifying asynchronous programming. And since it simplifies the programming, it also solves us the problem that we have seen before. And also, it will allow us to write the code that, we, uh, that was really difficult to write, the, you know, the four with the 100 operations. We will become, this will become very, very, I mean, not very, but uh, easy to write at least, okay? Um, actually, what's a promise? A promise is actually an object that represents the eventual, eventual completion or failure of an asynchronous operation. So we start an asynchronous operation and we know it will uh, be executed later. So we, will, we don't know what will be the result, right? So instead of saying, well, this will be the result that actually we don't know, we'll, uh, we will return immediately an object that will contain the result but will up be updated later, okay? So you call uh, 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 a function, okay, that uh, is supposed to be executed later. 
and not to block your code, but to have a way to recover the result of the operation later, you immediately return an object that is what we call promise that will be uh, filled with the result of the operation when it's finished. And it will also tell us if the operation will be successful or not. You remember one of the problems that we had before was how to represent if the operation had an error or not. So the object has two, uh, two functions, functions in the terms of uh, characteristics. Okay? It, it can represent the fact that uh, uh, the operation has been completed successfully or there has been a problem, a failure during the operation. And in both cases, we can add uh, inf additional information. So we can say if the operation was successful, this is the result. These are the rows in the case of the table. Or this is uh, you know, the, uh, what has been input inside the, 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 the console and so on. Okay? And if there is a problem, a failure, we can also add some information. Like, this is the exception, this is the problem, this is a string representing the kind of error that we had, and so on. Okay? So actually, the promise is an object representing the eventual completion or failure of an asynchronous operation. And it's a standard way of handling errors, one, um, and also handling you know, the results of the operation. And also, um, it's a way to provide, uh, it's, um, they can prov the promise provide a way for errors to propagate correctly through a chain of promises because we will see that, you know, as we did with the asynchronous callbacks, we nest the asynchronous callbacks. Here we will chain the promises which are actually the result value of each asynchronous operation. Instead of nesting functions, here we chain, so we put one object after the other, and we create a chain of results. And if there's an error, the error will be propagated through this chain. At a certain point, we can handle correctly this error. Okay? We'll see an example now because, of course, it's a very abstract concept and we need to understand how they work through examples. Uh, well, first of all, we need to understand uh, how to use these promises. First, promises can be created. So somebody has to create a promise. Who is creating the promise? Uh, the promise is created by the function that wants to immediately return a value, but has no value to return because it's asynchronous. Okay? So the asynchronous functions will, re will create the promise and return the promise to us. And then the promise can be consumed. When are they consumed? When there is actually a result of the operation. So we run the query, and we know the query has been successful, fine, and we have a result to return, the, the, the rows of the table. Right? So somebody can consume the promise, so take out the value once the value is available, okay? Or read the error if there's an error, okay? So, the promise, the object that represents the promise starts in a state which is called pending. Uh, the operation, the asynchronous operation which has been, which uh, returned initially the promise will be executed and the promise will change the state and will be either fulfilled or rejected okay that's the standard terminology for the promises okay so the asynchronous function creates a promise and every promise is created in this pending state and then somebody will say the asynchronous function will will say if the promise is fulfilled or rejected, depending on the result of the operation. And who has called the asynchronous function and so got the promise will be notified of the fact that the promise has changed the state and the state has become fulfilled or rejected. Okay? That's just the option, two options. 
So let's have a look uh, at some code and so we understand what's going on. First, how to create a promise? Well, uh, a promise is created like this. New promise with the new operator. Promise is predefined in the environment that we are going to use. So in later Node.js version is, is available in the browser is available. Okay. Uh, it's not from, you know, it's not really uh, from the start of the, the first version of the JavaScript language, but, uh, but it's from, yeah, uh, uh, ES 2017, okay? But basically we can use it and many, I mean, almost all programmers are using promises nowadays, okay? You create a promise using uh, the new constructor and the constructor takes uh, uh, the new um, syntax and the, the function promises, which actually it's a sort of constructor takes as a parameter a callback function, okay? Here is everything is a callback, right? Uh, this callback function is called executor, executor function, and it takes two functions again as parameters. One is the function to be called to resolve the promise in the fulfilled state, and the second Function is the function to be called to resolve the problem in the rejected state. Okay? Maybe th this example we could have written, you know, fulfill reject. Uh, it's better. Well, in, a, in, in any case, uh, first is when the promise is successful. Okay? And the second is when the promise is rejected. Okay? So there's been an error. And you can call those two functions with some values. And typically with the resolve, you call it with a value because actually you have something to return from your asynchronous function. Like in the example before, we have the rows of the table, right? Or uh, like uh, for, for, for reading from the keyboard, we have uh, what you have read, re uh, read from the keyboard, right? With the reject, typically you have the reason for rejection, a string or some object, whatever you would like to pass, okay? Here, is, that's JavaScript, you can pass whatever you want, okay? Typically an object if you don't have a simple string, but you can pass whatever you want, okay? Okay, so, you want to create a promise that's very easy. New promise. You would like to write uh, an asynchronous function, and this function, you only need to do one thing, return new promise, okay? And inside the code, oops, inside the code of the promise, you write whatever you want. So that's the code of the asynchronous function, okay? And at a certain point, when uh, you decide that you have the data, you just call the resolve with the data. Okay, and so you resolve the promise with the data you would like to return. Or if you encounter an error, you call the reject and uh, you pass some information to say why it's rejected if you would like to do that. Okay, so let's have a, a look uh, at the function. Function, let's say wait promise, so that's an asynchronous function, that's an uh, hypothesis, right? So Let's say our asynchronous function takes a parameter that's a, a duration. Let's say we would like to write a function that waits for a while. To have a simple example, right? Then we will write function to handle the DB, okay? But let's start with something simple. So we just return a promise, okay? Uh, in the promise, we say, well, there's a code. If we have a parameter which is not valid, like uh, uh, a duration less than zero, just to give, make an example where something can, can go wrong, right? So that's a problem. Well, we don't need to wait anything. We just say, well, the promise is rejected. So there's, there's a promise, uh, there's, a, there's a, an error, sorry. And so there's a promise rejected, and we pass something to reject. We can pass whatever we would like. We can just write a string, we can create an object error, we can create uh, 
uh, well, with the new, so error is a predefined object in JavaScript, but we don't really need to, to use this object. We can just open the curly bracket and, you know, set a number of fields and be more specific about the error, uh, whatever you would like to do, that's fine, okay? It's just a value for JavaScript. Else, else we can say, set timeout, resolve, duration, okay? So what, what's happening here? We take the library function set timeout, and we say to the library function, just wait for duration, and then call resolve, okay? So this resolve will not call immediately, it will call after a while, after a certain amount of time, after duration milliseconds, okay? That's all. We created the promise, so we call wait promise, we immediately get a reference to an object. We don't have to wait anything. So this function returns immediately, and we will get uh, a reference to an object that is actually a promise. And then, and then we are missing one piece. So, okay, we we will wait. Fine, the result will be called, and then and then how we get to the fact that the promise has been resolved, right? So I, either fulfilled or rejected. We need a piece, one more piece. Well, actually there are uh, three methods, okay, available in any promise. The first method is then. So any promise has uh, these three methods. One, two are here, then and catch, okay? So then is a method that we can call to attach our code, so a callback, to the fact that to be executed when the promise is fulfilled, okay? So when the, the promise is fulfilled, what we attach to the promise with the then will be executed. So that's the place where we put our code that we would like to execute when the promise is fulfilled. So in the previous case, when the duration has uh, passed. Right. And then we also have dot catch to which you, we can pass the code that we would like to execute when the promise has been rejected. So there's been uh, an error. Okay. The functions that we pass to then and catch takes parameters and actually takes as parameters the value of the promise which is actually either fulfilled or rejected, okay? So let's take the previous example. We call wait promise 1000, 1000 milliseconds means one second, right? But we immediately get a reference to an object that is a promise. So on this object, we can immediately call dot then and dot catch, right? Dot then, and we pass a callback. Well, actually, here the callback is very simple, a console log, right? Just to make the examples. And then each one of them, so then and catch, we return promises as well, so that we always have the possibility to write dot then, dot catch, so we can chain things together, okay? And this dot catch will take a function that will be executed in case the promise is rejected. So either the promise is fulfilled or it's rejected. So either this callback, the first, the then, so the console log success is executed, or the console log error is executed, okay? Because the promise starts in pending state and then is either fulfilled or rejected, okay? There's just one possible path. It cannot go back. Okay? If we need another promise, we create a new promise. But the promise just starts in pending state and it's either fulfilled or rejected. That's all. Okay? Catch is not mandatory. Actually, then as well is not mandatory. But without the then, we cannot uh, attach code to the fact that the promise is fulfilled. So the then 
is present typically because without the then we cannot do anything, right? Okay, so that's the the way of consuming a promise. So we so we create the promise. We need to consume the promise, and consuming the promise means take out the value. In the case it's fulfilled or it's rejected. Okay. So to the then you can pass one function, one callback actually, uh, which are actually again executed asynchronously. They don't need to be a synchronous function, but they are executed asynchronously. It means that the then is executed immediately because the promise is an object and you call then. But then what you what you write in the callback is not executed immediately. You need to wait for the promise to be fulfilled. Okay? But this is done automatically by the programming environment, by JavaScript. And then to the catch, you pass a callback to be executed when the promise is rejected. Okay? And then this, is res this system resembles more or less uh, you know, the, uh, um, uh, the exception system. You also have a dot finally. So for a callback that is executed in any case when the promise is either fulfilled or rejected. Okay? It's like the finally for the try catch. Right? In the try you write a code uh, uh, that you would like to execute if there's a problem, there's a catch, and if you have something to, write, uh, to execute in any case, you put it into the final. That's more or less the same concept, so you don't duplicate the code, okay? That's fine. Uh, I suggest you not to use the second parameter here because it's a bit more difficult to read, and you have the dot catch, you can always put the dot catch in the end, so there's no point in using the second parameter here, which actually is equivalent to write a dot catch afterwards. Okay? All these methods return promises too, so they can be changed. So we start with the promise and we can go dot then, dot then, dot then, dot then, okay? So we can change them easily. Th that's the point of having the promises. But for this to work, Every method should return a promise as well, okay? And those will be solved uh, in a chain automatically by JavaScript for us, no, no problem, okay? So in short, we create a promise or somebody creates a, prom a promise for us. A lot of li uh, function in the libraries, uh, JavaScript library creates promises, okay? So somebody creates a promise uh, the promise takes two parameters, resolve and reject, which are actually functions, to be called by the code of the asynchronous function. The parameters that you put here for uh, resolve and reject are simply the parameters that you get here in the callbacks when you use the dot then and dot catch. Actually, let's say you register the callback with the dot then and dot catch. I say register and not execute because they are executed afterwards, okay? So we are just notifying the promise that when the promise is fulfilled, this callback should be executed. When it is rejected, this promise, uh, this um, callback should be executed. Okay. So dot then, the promise is fulfilled. We execute this code, and the value that we have put, uh, we have put here resolve, is the one we get here as parameter, and so we can use it. Okay and the same for the reject. Okay. And one of the big advantages of using the promise is that we can chain them. Uh, so that's an, uh, one of the most important benefits. And it's a very, well, mm, yeah, very natural way of expressing a sequence of operations, a synchronous operation, where the, the second one needs to wait for the first one, the third one needs to wait for the second one to finish, and so on, okay? How can you express uh, this, uh, uh, this um, condition? Uh, you just return uh, a promise in the beginning, and then dot then, and you put your code here, okay? to be executed when the first promise is solved, okay? Then this operation, uh, if it's asynchronous, we return a promise 
phi, and then we can just write dot then, and this uh, second callback will be executed only when the first promise will be uh, fulfilled. So what's written inside here is finished, okay? And so on for the third operation, etc. And if some promise get rejected, no problem. Then dot then is not executed. So when uh, when the promise is rejected, the callbacks that you specified in the dot then are not executed, and you just go on until you find the dot catch, and the dot catch will have some code, and this code will be executed. Okay. And if you really want to be called in any case, you end up with the dot finally, for instance, for logging operations or you know closing uh, resources, etc. you can use the finally. okay? Otherwise, you should put a dot then in the end and the dot catch in the end with the same code, so that in any case you do the, the closing or the logging operation. okay? To make this chaining work, there's one important thing to remember. That means that the callback that you specify inside the dot then need to return a value because the value returned by this callback is the new value for the promise for the next then. So you see this syntax. This is an arrow function this arrow functions as an implicit return value, but there, there is the return value, okay? If I put the curly brackets here, nothing works anymore, okay? Yes, yeah, there's a question. The underscore is just a, a name of a variable. So dummy, if you like, or foo bar, whatever, okay? It's just, yeah, I know, it's, I, I left it here, I mean, not really nice code to see, but I mean, it's just we we could simply also open and close a, a bracket. But sometimes I put these things so I know you are awake and <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But I mean, uh, yeah, I mean it's just a name, a valid name of a variable for JavaScript. Okay, no, and there's no real need to write in this way. Okay, um, so. To have this chain work, you need to return something in each callback because what you return is what you get here as a parameter for the next callback in the next dot then. Okay? And if you don't return anything, you know what's the return value of functions for JavaScript if you don't specify anything. You'll get undefined. So you will work with this as undefined and nothing works and it will break. Okay? So remember to return the value that you would like to return when the promise is fulfilled, okay? And typically, uh, we have a chain of then because we expect that everything works. And we only have one catch because we expect that at a certain point something is, uh, doesn't work the promise gets rejected and the rest should not be executed because it depends on the previous operations. So it's a chain, right? If it's a certain point, the chain is, uh, breaks, I mean, you don't really need to execute the rest of the chain because it doesn't make sense, okay? So that's why you take the return value and you put it into the value of the fulfilled promise because for the rejected promise, there will be another value, but you will not execute it then. You will execute the catch and typically you will stop performing the rest of the operations. Okay? Um, so basically this solves uh, our callback hell that we have seen before, right? Because here we are not nesting anything, right? There's a chain of operations, so we can even put them line by line. So you might argue it's not really nice code, might be, <laughs> but at least it's not nested. Nesting things is a lot difficult, uh, you know, in programming, even just for thinking, not only for writing. Okay, so this is a chain of operation. At a certain point, the chain is broken. You jump to the catch, and that's all, right? Okay. 
This is very useful for input-output operations. Uh, for instance, there are very, very important uh, function that we will uh, use in the browser, that is the fetch function, that is available in any uh, modern browser. And this function, since it's asynchronous, so it goes to a website and loads some resources, it returns a promise. So we need to know and understand how the promise system works. Why it returns a promise? Because it's asynchronous, because it doesn't know when it finishes. You go to a server, you ask for something, and it might take a while to, to get a result. Okay? Fine. And so I immediately give you an object with the promise in pending state. You write dot then, dot catch, and you attach your code, and your code will be executed once you have the result. And the fetch will fill, fulfill actually the, the promise with the value that is being loaded from the server. Okay? And if there's a problem, it will uh, reject the promise and you, you will execute the, the code with the catch. Okay? So just to have a look at uh, some code, you see fetch returns a promise, then status status is a function remember we just need to pass a reference to a function we can define the function wherever we like status has been defined here response if response is fine uh, return again promise resolve otherwise promise rejected that's another way of returning a, a resolved or reject promise so if you actually really want to i mean reject a promise in a condition like this uh, either you, you create, you know, return new promise, or you also have this option to return a promise which has already been resolved or rejected, okay? If you already know the value, okay? So it's a, a bit less uh, heavy to write uh, than return new promise, uh, resolve, reject, uh, and call them, okay? This, there are just a couple of static methods on the object promise. I mean, static methods actually in JavaScript, they are methods like the others, but in the sense that you don't need to use the keyword new, okay? So return promise resolve or promise reject, okay? And then JSON, JSON, response JSON, we'll see these things uh, uh, later. Just remember, arrow function, implicit return value, actually dot JSON is something that returns the promise as well. You just need to trust me for the moment. Okay, and then and then you write whatever you like, a console log, etc., or catch the error and do whatever you like as well. Okay, but with, with the fetch we will talk uh, more later. Okay, we can also run code in parallel. Once we have the promises, uh, uh, it's nice to you know be able to run uh, some asynchronous code in parallel. Uh, for instance, you have uh, to request the resources from two different websites or two different uh, network resources in general. I mean, there's no need to wait for the first to complete while you could ask for the second, right? So, no problem. Uh, how can we execute the several asynchronous operations in parallel? Well, actually, uh, we just uh, launch those uh, uh, operations. So we run the first asynchronous operation, means the first call, we return like a fetch, we return a promise. So we have immediately have an object. It's an object that is a promise in a pending state. Fine. And then we immediately launch a second operation. So we run another fetch, for instance, and we immediately have a second object, which is a second uh, uh, promise impending state. So we have two promises now, two promises in pending state. How, w w what are we going to do? I mean, w where are we writing the dot then now? We have two promises, not just one. If it's just one, you dot then, that's fine, right? There are two. Well, we need to decide if we would like to wait for everything. And so there's a static method again, and promise all, takes an array of promises, returns a promise as well, okay? 
And this promise, returned by the promise all, will be fulfilled or rejected only at the end when all promises have a resolved state, so either fulfilled or rejected. So we know the, uh, how all promises have ended, right? And, um, and the return promise will be either fulfilled, if everything is fulfilled, or rejected if at least one, one of the input's promises is rejected. And if everything is fulfilled, we'll get an array with the values of the fulfilled promises. Because now we have more promises, right? So we have more return values. And so instead of getting a single value, we get an array of values, right? Uh, okay. Or there is this dot race that waits for the first promise to be resolved, okay? Any of them. Uh, why can be useful? Sometimes you ask, you know, the same thing in different places and you just want to get, uh, you know, the first answer. That's a possibility, okay? But this is very uncommon, I would say, okay? Uh, okay. This takes us to the last topic for today, which is anyway important because you, you, you will use this a lot in your code. Okay, so this is async await. So from ES8, so from a certain version of the language, JavaScript language, two new keywords have been introduced in the language, async and await. Okay, uh, so it's not ES6, but, but as I told you, uh, before, uh, we can use, uh, let's say, modern language, uh, JavaScript language constructs, uh, so like this ones, this keyword, etc. because either the environment supports it, like the Node.js recent version supports uh, even more than ES8, or the browser supports it, or in any case, we have a framework that in a certain way handles the problems for us. So it translates this into older code. Okay, automatically, without us, uh, without uh, um, problems and no, no need to have a look on the, on the generated code, okay? So, uh, this async and await are based on promises, so that's why we introduced the promises. We can use promises directly, that's fine, no, no, uh, no problem, it's, it's okay. But with this async await, the code will be even easier to write, to read, and to maintain, okay? So, what do these keywords do? Uh, if you put a sync in front of the name of, of, an, or, well, no, of the function definition, okay? It could be a name, it could be whatever. Uh, if you put a sync in front of the function definition, you make the function automatically return a promise, even though inside it does not return a promise. It returns just a value, fine. But if you put a sync in front, it will return a promise when it finishes, okay? And the second keyword, await, is even nicer because if you call an async function with a wait in front, the code will stop and wait for the async function to finish. So in a certain sense, you make an asynchronous function behave like an asynchronous function because you wait for the end of the function, but the difference is that you don't block the rest of your code. So JavaScript can can continue interpreting the stuff because it's just the flow of execution of this code that has been blocked. But the rest of the code can run. So JavaScript uh, uh, always looks for something to run, okay? This await waits for the completion of the async function. So in short, it waits for the promise to be either fulfilled or rejected automatically without you writing uh, then catch, etc. Okay, but you didn't block 
the flow execution of your program because once this flow execution is blocked, the JavaScript looks for something else to, to execute. If there's nothing, that's nothing. But if there's something else, like there's a query to be run from the uh, SQL tree library and so on, it runs the query and do all the stuff, okay? And your code will be resumed once you have a result of the promise, either fulfilled or rejected, okay? So let's say, uh, const, a simple function, that's an async function. So we just write async before the definition of the function, okay? Async, no parameters, uh, return test, okay? Return a string. And then we take the function, we call it. The function returns a promise. So what we have seen until now for the promises is still valid. So you can write dot then, dot catch. Even though here inside you didn't do promise reject, promise fulfill, new promise, etc. Just because you wrote async here, this function now returns a promise. So you can use all the things that you learned when we talked about promises. Okay? Then console log it means that we when you have a result of the async function, so the promise is fulfilled, the promise will have uh, the fulfilled promise will have this value, the string, as the value of the fulfilled promise. With the dot then, it means that the fulfilled promise will tell that it's finished, and the then will execute the console log function on the value of the fulfilled promise, so on the test. So it will be passed as a parameter, the first parameter to the function that you specify here. You can open the brackets and write uh, string, uh, arrow, console log string, or just say console log because console log is a function, it's already defined, it's already ready to take a value, right? Okay? You can test it, this, uh, this code yourself, it's just a couple of lines of code. This stuff doesn't run in the Python tutor because it's too complex, you know. But, uh, I mean, you can, you can write it into the Visual Studio code and test it, uh, you'll see that it will work, okay? So just a couple of, mm, a few more words about async and await. So async defines an asynchronous function in the sense that we can make any function Asynchronous because we make it return a promise, okay? For us, an asynchronous function is a function that returns a promise at the moment. Uh, <coughs> asynchronous functions operate in a separate order than the rest of the code via the event loop that we will see next time, I think. Um, and it, uh, they return a promise as the, as the result. And actually, if you don't call, uh, if you don't write like a return promise, etc., so you already return a promise, so this promise is simply taken as the return value. If you have a value, like before, we have the string, right? The string or any, any value you pass will become the value of the fulfilled promise. That's all, okay? Uh, and you can write a function uh, in the way you like. I mean, this is just usual function. It's just that prepending the async keyword, you make it return a promise, okay? And the return value will be simply put into the fulfilled value of the promise, okay? And the await, wait for a promise to be fulfilled or rejected. Okay, this is just a little warning. A wait can only be used inside an async function, okay? Uh, so you cannot just wait wherever you like, but uh, I mean, this is not a big limitation. You open a new function, you define it as sync, and, and you can use it, and then you call the async function outside, okay? A wait blocks, blocks the code execution within the async function until the promise is resolved, okay? So the, you understand now why we can use a wait only inside an async function. Because if we write a wait somewhere, we make the function where we wrote the await an async function automatically. And so it has to be defined async, okay? So that's a, 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 a constraint by the language. When the function resumes, the value of the await expression is that of the fulfilled promise, 
okay? So you see, there's a value here. We can assign the value of this expression that will be a function, right? Or some, some async function, okay? Uh, actually, it could be also no, not a function, but later. Okay, a weight, there's a value, and this value is the return value, and it's actually the value of the fulfilled promise, okay? So that's a, let's say, linear way of handing the, the promises and the async await function. What happens in case of rejection? Because for the rejections we saw, there's dot then, but also dot catch. Where's the dot catch here? Well, actually there's no dot catch, but actually there's an exception, a JavaScript exception. So the await expression throws the rejected value, and we need to capture it with the actually try catch of JavaScript. Okay? Uh, there, there will be an example, I think. Yep. Uh, if the value following a wait is not a promise, it will simply convert it into a fulfilled promise. This is a general rule. Everything which is not a promise is just an immediate value, so that nothing asynchronous just becomes a fulfilled promise when it's used, okay? It makes sense, there's nothing to wait. I mean, we already have the result, it's a result, there's no error because it's just an expression, fine. It's a fulfilled promise. Okay, so let's have a look at the example. Uh, so, function. A function that resolves after two seconds. We, we always do, you know, this, uh, this example with the set timeout because it, it, they are easy. I mean, we, we cannot just, uh, you know, run fetch and go and take stuff from a site and so on because it's more difficult to code, right? Uh, instead, a timer is very easy to use, right? So, this is a function that returns a promise I, in the old way, in the way we, we saw this morning, right? So return new promise, resolve reject. I mean, we don't have the reject because we don't want to reject, but you know, JavaScript is like this. If we omit a parameter, so if we don't specify a parameter, no problem. JavaScript, you know, <laughs> don't have any problem on this. Simply ignore it, okay? The code will not fail because of this. So resolve. Okay, when, when, uh, when we resolve it, when uh, after uh, two seconds. So set timeout, we'll call it resolve with the value resolved, that's a string that will be put into the fulfilled promise after two seconds, okay? And then, we can simply await for this function. Actually, this is an asynchronous function because it returns a promise, okay? But a wait can take an expression. If it returns a promise, fine, we'll wait for the promise. If it doesn't return a promise, it's converted into a fulfilled promise, as we said before. So it's actually not that useful, right? But uh, just to, you know, make sure everything works. A wait, resolve after two seconds, and then we, we write console log result. So the result uh, of this expression, and the result of this expression is actually the value of the fulfilled promise. So after two seconds, the promise will be resolved and the value will be resolved. So the string resolved that we specified here, right? Okay. And then we can call the async function. Okay, async function can be called anywhere. But a wait, a wait, uh, a wait, uh, can be written only inside a sync function. So we cannot simply write here, await resolve after two seconds. It will give, you, give us an error because the main scope of JavaScript is not an async function, okay? But it's really easy to overcome because you just uh, create a new async function and call uh, the, the async function with the await, no problem. And then we call this function, right? So. Very easy. So you'll see calling, and then we will wait for two seconds, and then you'll see the result resolved. Okay. Um, so you can try this code, and not sure how much time I have, so it's better not to try. But uh, that's the behavior. Okay. You have it in in the GitHub, so you can test this code. Um, so uh, it's really 
likes as sequential code. Uh, really like, uh, looks, sorry, looks like a sequential code. Okay? So, we write something, we call an asynchronous function, but we would like to wait for the asynchronous function to complete. Just put a wait. If everything is fine, we solved our problem, right? But we didn't block anything else. So in the meanwhile, in these two seconds, during these two seconds, something else can be done. We didn't block anything because of this system with promises, etc. Okay? That's another way of writing the same thing. So uh, this async call that we defined async before, okay? Uh, don't uh, return anything, okay? We'd like to re we would like to return something. Okay, fine, we return something. Where does it go? It goes in the value of the fulfilled promise. Yes, that's the question. To use the await, we need to have a promise in the function we called it? No. But without, it's a bit useless, okay? That's because here we say that if the value is the expression here, following the await operator is not a promise, it's converted into a resolved promise. So it's if, if it's a value, a number, a string, and so on, it's immediately a resolved promise. So you don't really have anything to wait. So it's a bit useless to wait. Uh, I wait for something which does not make you wait, right? That's, that's the only reason, but it's still valid in JavaScript, okay? So that's a question of your colleague, okay? So if we call something with the await and no promise, you can do it, but it's a bit useless. Probably there's an error in some place because you, you would like to wait for something, but there's nothing you, you need to wait, okay? Let's see here, uh, that's a result, you can return, no, sorry, this one. This is, uh, you can return something from an async function. Since you declare it as a sync, the return value will be the value of the fulfilled promise. So you cannot simply write uh, uh, console log async call, okay? Console log async call will not work. A thing called dot then console log will wor work, okay? Console log a thing call will not print uh, something use, uh, useful. Console log a thing call will print an object of type promise, but we we don't care about the object, right? You can try it, uh, try it yourself, so you you understand the difference. In one case, you print the object, but I mean, I I don't care about the object. I care about the result, this return end. So the second console log, this console log will print end, okay? So just think in terms of a sync and a wait as if they are promises, and that's all. And you, you have understood, you know, how to use a sync and wait. So you can always change the code from one form to the other. So if you have the then, you can write the code with the await, okay? You just need to be careful because, uh, uh, no, that's no example. If you have the catch as well, you need to have a try catch. So this is really nice if everything works, so promise get fulfilled and you don't care about the reject. But if you care about the reject, you need to be a bit careful because you complicate the code, you need to have try catch, etc. okay? So, in short, same function, get API data, you can use it with the dot then and put your code, or you can await, this, get, this is an expression, you can do whatever you like, like console log, etc. Okay, or assign to a variable, whatever. You have two dot then, like uh, the example that we saw before. Okay, of course we assume that all the function return a promise, otherwise this is a bit useless, right? Um, well, you see this code, issue, await, get issue, and then owner, await, get owner, issue. So it looks like a sequential code. 
It stops uh, when it needs to stop and wait for something, and then it goes on and so on. And that's automatic, okay? The only thing you need to make sure uh, that that is uh, uh, valid is that uh, you need to have functions that return promises, okay? That's all. Uh, because with the then, it's automatic. Then returns a promise, okay? And the other, you need to be a bit more careful, okay? Uh, so, even also, when you have a more complex code, okay, this await will help you a lot, okay? Because, let's say, you need to await for three, four actions, because they are sequential, Writing like this is very simple, right? S uh, seems a normal code, okay? And also it's easier to debug, just in case, eh? when, when you would like to debug, because you put a breakpoint and you are not nested uh, in some places around in the code, in some callbacks, etc. It just looks like sequential code at a certain point the debugger resumes and so on, okay? So the, that's mm, function. The, the, that's uh, fine. Uh, so, we talked about promises and we talked about async and wait. Is there a suggestion I, uh, I can give you about using either promises or async and wait? Well, uh, probably these are good guidelines. <laughs> I mean, just to simplify the way you program and make programs more readable and so on, okay? You can do whatever mix you like, but if the promises don't help you, I mean, probably are not that useful. So if you have a, a function two, dependent on the output of function one, use a wait, it's very simple, right? W wait for the first and then you do the second. Very readable and so on. If you know, need to run things in parallel, there's no other way than using the promise all. Okay, no other way. Don't create async functions which are very, very big. Because, uh, because uh, basically, uh, an async function is a function where the code is blocked until things are resolved inside, right? So it's better to have smaller functions, async functions, so that w when you call the functions, you know when they are resolved, they, when they are finished, and between one of the other, uh, you can do other things if you need, okay? And if your code contains blocking code, it's, it's better to make it an async function, okay? Because there's no need, uh, you know, to, to wait that much time. I mean, you just prepend. So write, before your function, you write async, you magically created an async function, okay? And then when you call it, you decide how to use it. You would like to wait, await, and so on. You would like to proceed with your code, dot then and, and write other code. You decide if you would like to stop there or continue. If it's an async function, that's easy, really easy, okay? So, coming back to the SQLite and then we, we have finished, okay? You remember uh, uh, we had async functions? Just create promises and resolve the promise once you get a result in the callback of the SQLi3 function. So the run and, and the all, etc. So you see in the end there's resolve with the value. Okay? So we took out the result from the callback and now we have a place where we store it. It's the value of the fulfilled promise. Okay, and so the code that gave us a lot of troubles before, now it's so easy to write. Await insert, await uh, count, print count, right? Every time it stops and wait for the query to be executed because we wait for the promise and the promise is resolved only when the query is finished because the callback of the SQLite tree is finished, is called, okay? So just be careful, you know, which one is buggy, and then we finish, okay?
Which one is buggy? <laughs> is it the left or the right? So please give me a good feedback <laughs> on the lecture. <laughs> so, you see the async function, this is just a function definition. We call it the main, the main simply gets a, a promise as a result. A promise which is still in pending state. If you close the DB with the promise in pending state, you are not allowing this operation to, to, to go on correctly, right? You close the DB in the middle of the operations. So you need to close the DB here inside because you waited for all the queries to be executed, okay? So the left is correct, the right is wrong. Just try them. You'll see that at a certain point you get an error, okay? Many libraries to be used uh, for SQLi3, different flavors. Have a look uh, at them, use whatever you like. I mean, as usual, we have a, a recommendation, which is the SQLi3, the one we, we saw before. It's a bit basic. You need to create the promise yourself, but probably once you get used, you get an example. I mean, you just need to copy and paste, and there's not, not so much you need to invent, okay? So tomorrow in the lab with my colleague Antonio, we, you will experiment with this stuff. I'll put uh, the lab online now, okay? You can already read the, the text of the lab now. I didn't do it before because, you know, I, I needed to explain all this stuff. But, you know, you can start working uh, since this afternoon, okay? So we'll meet on Thursday in room 16, okay, for our next lecture. Okay. See you. Thank you.